This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by DelanceyPlace.com. Did you know that the United States' Declaration of Independence is one of at least 90 declarations of independence? It seems that many states and localities author declarations of independence for a variety of related purposes. Some declarations, like those written by Virginia and New Jersey, formally ended the old regime within their states, and other declarations simply authorized congressional delegates to vote for independence. With excerpts from Pauline Mayer's book, American Scripture, Making of the Declaration of Independence, DelanceyPlace.com asks us to think about why all these documents exist and what it means that our history contains so many declarations of independence. If you think these are fun questions to think about, sign up for DelanceyPlace.com's free daily email. Text NONFICTION to 22828 or visit DP1776.com. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 126 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you Learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. What happened to the Loyalists who stayed? As we've heard from historians in earlier episodes, about 60,000 Loyalists and 15,000 slaves left the United States after the War for Independence. But what happened to the thousands of Loyalists who, for one reason or another, opted to remain in the United States after the War for Independence? Rebecca Brannon, an associate professor of history at James Madison University and author of From Revolution to Reunion, The Reintegration of South Carolina Loyalists, joins us to explore this question with details about the war for independence in South Carolina, patriot plans to reintegrate Loyalists back into South Carolinian society after the war, and details about how Loyalists worked to make amends after the war and earn their way back into society. But first, would you like to meet in person? As it happens, I travel a fair bit every year, mostly around the United States, and I think it would be fun to get together for an informal tea or beer. So I've posted a list of my known travel dates and destinations in the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook, and I hope that when I land in places like Oneida County, New York, Philadelphia, Ann Arbor, or Anaheim, that we can meet up just to say hi and just to chat. If you're interested in meeting up, join the Ben Franklin's World community by texting BFWORLD233444 or by clicking on the orange Join Now button on the Ben Franklin's World homepage. This way, we can stay in touch and try to make plans together. Are you ready to find out more about what happened to some of the Loyalists who stayed after the War for Independence? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of history at James Madison University, She studies the history and memory of the War for Independence and American Loyalists. And today she joins us to discuss the War for Independence and the reintegration of Loyalists in South Carolina with details from her book, From Revolution to Reunion, The Reintegration of South Carolina Loyalists. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Rebecca Brannon. Thank you, Liz. I'm excited. And we're excited to have you because we're anxious to explore the War for Independence in South Carolina, and this will really be our first dedicated investigation of it. Wow. I know it's taken us a while to get down here, but we're here, and I think this will be a really fun conversation. Now, Rebecca's book, From Revolution to Reunion, explores the reintegration of Loyalists into South Carolina society after the War for Independence. But before we investigate this aspect of the post-revolutionary period, Rebecca, would you provide us with an overview of what the Revolution and War for Independence were like in South Carolina? In short, nasty and terrifying if you had to actually live through it. In many other places in early America, the revolution followed the rules of ordinary organized warfare in the 18th century armies, which at least some of the time followed their commander's orders. But in South Carolina and Georgia, it became a true civil war, and that civil war was fought by guerrilla units on both sides, often with a local loyalist leader or a local patriot leader and enlisted men who are from the area who are fighting their own neighbors and who use their knowledge of the local terrain to terrify civilians, 
show up unexpectedly, and otherwise create a lot of terrifying chaos across the region. So the war in South Carolina was really a case of neighbor versus neighbor and farmer versus farmer. Absolutely. And I often talk about the fact that there were far more brothers fighting brothers in South Carolina in the American Revolution than there ever was in the American Civil War. One of my favorite cases is the Lacey family. Edward Lacey was a patriot militia leader, but his old father was this angry <laughs> loyalist. And one night, Edward Lacey shows up with his militia unit planning a dawn attack the next morning on a loyalist militia unit nearby. And in the middle of the night, they catch his old father trying to sneak out of the house to deliver intelligence to this loyalist unit, which, of course, would have put his own son's life in danger. But he's so committed, right? He tries to sneak out of the house. Because he's old, the Lacey family takes pity on him and they just tie him to the bedstead. And here he is through the entire battle the next day tied to his own bedstead. But if he'd been younger, he probably would have been executed for that. Wow, that's quite a story. Now, do we have any idea of just how divided South Carolina was during the revolution? It is a great question, Liz. And it's a really hard one to answer since nobody was standing there taking a survey. We certainly have some estimate nationwide. John Adams at the time famously said one third of Americans were loyalists, one third of Americans were patriots, and one third were desperately trying to stay neutral. And there's always been some good evidence behind that. The thing that's always struck me nationwide is probably 20 to 30,000 people left the United States at the conclusion of the war and essentially become loyalist refugees, hoping that the British will set them up somewhere else. But there were probably 500,000 loyalists across the 13 original states. So really, the vast majority of them stay in the United States after the war, and only a small minority, despite how terrible the war was, had to ultimately leave. In South Carolina, the best figure we have is that about 4,000 people left after the war, but not all of them are from South Carolina because it's one of the major ports that the British used to transport these refugees out of the area. Of course, lots of people get dubbed loyalists, even when they did very little. Others, perhaps the best way to measure, is somebody actually a loyalist for men, is do they take up arms? And there we're probably looking at something like 10,000 men who participate actively at some point. As you've looked at a lot of different records to get at who the loyalists were and to uncover more about their stories, would you tell us whether the historical record reveals whether there was a certain type of person who chose to remain loyal or a certain type of person who opted to rebel as a patriot? We historians have always tried to figure out what predisposed somebody to be a loyalist, but there really isn't anything that seems to fit, especially in South Carolina. The only thing we can say pretty definitively is this is still a society with an awful lot of noblesse oblige. You follow the leader. And so usually in a community, once the leading men of the community had elected a side for whatever reason, and there were a wide number of reasons, then most of the men in the community followed them in. And often if they become a loyalist commander or a patriot commander because it's the elite who serve as officers, in the military, then the men in their community will literally serve under them. But all of these other things like religion or whether they're sort of naturally psychologically conservative in the sense they don't like change, none of it really seems to suggest who's going to be a loyalist and who's going to be a patriot. And part of it is because a lot of people just try to stay neutral, which makes sense. A lot of us aren't the kind of people who like to stick our neck out for no good reason. And they're able to do this in South Carolina until 1780, when the British invade the state, take the major city and port of Charleston, and gradually start to subdue the rest of the state. And people are faced with a choice. And if they choose to take what's called British protection, they choose to say, oh, yes, welcome, British. We're so glad you invaded. Well, maybe not, right? But if they say all these nice things, then the British say, we'll guarantee your property rights. Life can go along as it was before, so long as you don't fight. Essentially, they're promised neutrality, and a lot of people find that an attractive option. So one of the things I found when I was researching is a lot of people aren't motivated by what we would understand as ideology or politics. Interesting. But if they weren't motivated by ideology and politics, what actually motivated people to choose a side? It's a great question. Again, some of it is follow the leader. 
we literally have examples of people who choose to join the side that didn't plunder them first. So they ride off in anger against whichever side plundered their horses first, and that's how they choose allegiances. This is really the marker of a local civil war, rather than what we think of as a learned decision about what kind of government you want. The British sometimes thought that religion predicted who became a loyalist. In fact, one commander, Wims, becomes so obsessed with the idea that the Presbyterians are all terrible patriot supporters that he goes around burning all these Presbyterian churches in the South Carolina backcountry. But there's no actual statistical evidence that they're more likely to be patriots than anyone else. It's the British who become obsessed with this kind of stuff. And what about slavery? Slavery played a huge role in early American history. And I have to wonder, what role did slavery play in South Carolinians' decision on whether to remain loyal or to rebel against Great Britain? It's a great question. And of course, everything in the white society is dominated by the fact that this is a slave society. And white South Carolinians are setting on this huge, restive population of enslaved people. And in South Carolina's low country, there is literally a slave or a black majority. And they depend on the population of what's called the back country to guarantee an overall white majority in South Carolina. And there's always this sense in slaveholding societies that white people can't have too much open anger with each other and too much open disunity or else the slaves might get the idea that this is a great time for a slave revolt. So there's certainly this always in the background, but civil war comes to South Carolina anyway, even though they're a slave society and there are slaveholders on both sides of the war. And All of them believe that they somehow fight the civil war and keep the system of slavery intact. It's slaves who decide, oh, look, there's open disunity. There's war going on in our state. The British are there. They've got to be a better option than the Americans. We will flee to British lines seeking our freedom. Up to this point, we've talked a lot about the divisive nature of the war. But what was the after effect? In 1783, when the war officially ended, What did South Carolina and its society look like? I was struck first by the physical destruction in the state. A lot of infrastructure, a lot of homes had been burnt to the ground during the war. Crop fields had been destroyed. And there are people at the time who write about the mood of the people matches the physical destruction. One wrote, all is desolation. And it's clear he's talking about the people's mood as well as the reality of destruction. And they desperately want to look forward to a more promising, more prosperous future. And in some ways, that's very American to always look to the future. But they also have this reality that they've just fought the Civil War, that 20% or more of the slave population of South Carolina had fled to British lines during the war, seeking their own freedom. We often call them the Black Loyalists, but they really don't have a lot of choice at the end of the war. They cannot stay in South Carolina. If they stay in South Carolina, they'll either be executed or re-enslaved. And so they take British transportation and end up in Nova Scotia trying to restart their lives there. The net effect in South Carolina is you have a slave society that feels undermined. People feel like they've lost their property. They've lost their wealth. Even the victorious patriots are constantly ruminating on the destruction of their estates, the loss of value. And so then they're trying to look forward to the future. What can we build for ourselves? And in the midst of all of this are thousands of loyalists who have elected not to leave with the British, who are making overtures to their neighbors, who are returning to their properties, even if the law says they can't, they do it anyway. And they're trying to essentially make nice, apologize, and recreate these connections with their neighbors at the same time that everybody is trying to rebuild their society and their wealth. So when did South Carolina patriots start thinking about all of the loyalists around them? I mean, they have to build a new South Carolina after the war. So when do they start thinking about making amends with loyalists and using them to help build their new state? That's a great question and one that fascinated me as I worked on this project. I started with what they actually did legislatively in law. In early 1782, at a time when there's still some fighting going on in the state and a peace treaty had not even been signed ending the war for independence, because that won't happen until 1783, 
they meet and they decide to confiscate the property of some 300 loyalists. It's almost 400 on the list, but if you look closely, a good fourth of them are actually London merchant houses and they're just confiscating property left in the United States. They aren't sort of individuals who are living there. And on the face of it, the Confiscation Act is a very harsh piece of legislation that says, okay, for those 300 people who are unlucky enough to be on the Confiscation Act, all of their property is confiscated from the men and their wives and children. It's forfeit to the state. They lose their citizenship. They're banished. But in fact, when I started looking at what the legislature was doing, they essentially advertised, hey, loyalists, we're thinking about confiscating your property. And they give them multiple chances to return to Patriot lines and for men to serve in the Patriot militia. And this is at a time when the worst of the fighting is over. And they essentially keep advertising, hey, you have a chance to come back. And in their letters, you even see excitement. After this was announced in Charleston, more than 100 loyalists have trickled into camp, have taken this offer. So on the one hand, there is this harsh-seeming punishment. And on the other hand, it covers up the fact that hundreds more are coming back to the Patriot side, are being given a second chance. And who decided to give the loyalists a second chance? I know from studying other places like Massachusetts and New York that there's always an internal divide between those who live in the city and those who live in the country. Did South Carolina have a similar divide in its politics? Was there one party who dominated their government and said, hey, we're going to pass this confiscation act and give loyalists a second chance? In my reading, no. In my reading, ultimately, the state, all of its citizens agree this is the best move. It takes them two years to get there. In 1782, they confiscate some of this property, and in 1784, they end up giving almost all of it back in a mass clemency action. And what happened in the meantime is they had started off being generous to all but a few, and those few largely ignore the requirement to leave the state. And in the back country, most of them weren't wealthy enough to be on the original list. But what's happening all around the state is that loyalists are writing letters from the safety of Charleston, apologizing to their former neighbors. And they're reaching out and they're using their social connections. And in a few cases, we have evidence that they get letters back saying, if you show your face here, we'll kill you. And those people leave with the British. And the rest of them get much more grudging letters that essentially say, well, I'm not ready to forgive you yet, but come back and we'll keep talking. They don't put it exactly that way. But that's the message. Philip Porche is in Charleston, and he goes back to his low country plantation on the Santee River. And he's on this Confiscation Act of 1782, and he's told, you know, you're supposed to leave the state. And he just ignores it and goes back to his plantation. And not only that, he gets an official military pass from none other than General Francis Marion, who is the leading war hero in South Carolina and is sympathetic to these loyalists. And he goes back with this military pass. Don't molest this man from this major military hero, Marion. And he goes back and he starts writing his neighbors and he starts visiting his neighbors and apologizing. And by 1783, he's got over 40 neighbors who are willing to sign their name to a petition that he'll ultimately submit to the legislature saying, offer this man clemency. Give him his property back because we attest that he is of good character and he's a good neighbor and we're willing to overlook what we now think were small mistakes during the war. And you see this repeated again and again all across South Carolina. This seems to be a really unique situation because when you look at New York and New Jersey, those states pass confiscation acts and their citizens look forward to confiscating loyalist property. I mean, they hope to confiscate property so that they could pay their war debts. What was so different about South Carolina? Why did they give estates back to loyalists and opt not to put a lot of loyalists on their confiscation rolls? <laughs> the reason I laugh is the people who are pushing confiscation to begin with have the same starry-eyed dream that the people in New York have, that if they confiscate these properties, it will solve all the state's financial problems. And you can even see it in the legislative records that they sort of have this slush fund in mind, created by sales of confiscated properties, and it's going to allow them to pursue all their pet projects, even at a time that the state is struggling to pay its bills. My favorite one is they vote to provide the whole legislature with mahogany chairs, and they say, well, we'll pay for it out of the confiscation fund. 
And of course, there are always people who are acting out of self-interest. My favorite anti-hero, I guess, is Edward Rutledge, who is the Speaker of the General Assembly in 1782, who is the author of the Confiscation Act, who pushes it through, and at the same time, his brother is governor of the state. Then, after he gets confiscation, he forms an investment company with a couple of partners, and they pool their money and buy what they see as good deals out of the confiscated estate. So sort of political corruption at its finest at some level. And even though all of this is happening and everybody thinks they're really going to make money out of this, there are a lot of people who start to have second thoughts. Perhaps especially as it becomes clear that the people who are going to profit from this are the same people who've profited from everything. The historians used to hope that, if nothing else, confiscated estates would have at least democratized landholding, allowed people without much to get a foothold in society. But when you look back, there's absolutely no evidence that that happened. I have to believe that even though the majority of loyalists got their property back or never even really experienced the threat of having it taken away in the first place, that South Carolina must have made examples out of at least a few loyalists. Could you use these examples to answer Andrew's questions? Andrew would really like to know how the process of loyalist property confiscation took place and what legal cases looked like when those loyalists tried to reclaim their property. It's a good question. Of course, they definitely had some scapegoats or what Adonis Burke of South Carolina called you would throw a tub to a whale to satisfy the public. There are fewer legal cases than there are in other states. So when I think about New York, I think about Alexander Hamilton's involvement in the Rutgers case. And there's another similar case out of North Carolina. The interesting thing about South Carolina is South Carolina largely closes off the use of the courts to settle these questions, in part because one of their leading jurists, Adonis Burke, is adamantly opposed to using the courts. And there's an incident in 1783 that Adonis Burke himself may have kind of ginned up to make his case that it was a bad idea to use the court system where he's in the back country. And it's not a case about property so much as it's a case about war crimes. A man with the eternal name Matthew Love, who is accused of war crimes, and the court wants to prosecute him. The people want to use the courts to prosecute him for what they see as war crimes during the war. And what he's accused of is going around the battlefield and killing men who are laying there gasping for breath. And he's running them through with his sword. And they try to try him in 1783 for murder. And Burke says, no, you can't do this. The Treaty of Paris that ends the war won't let you do this. And it's a bad idea. It's ex post facto justice. You can't do this. And so the crowd lets him go up to his chambers, grabs Matthew Love, carries him out of sight of the courthouse and hangs him from the nearest tree that Burke can't see. And Burke writes about this and uses this larger goal, which is to keep issues of which loyalists get clemency and why at the level of the legislature instead of in the courts. And so the actual answer is there's almost no famous court cases because they keep it in the legislature. And the legislature chooses to offer a mass clemency in 1784 to the vast majority of loyalists that they had made examples of two years before. And then they hold the line after that. We've talked a lot about how patriots crafted plans and schemes to reintegrate loyalists. But did loyalists play any part or take any active role in their own reintegration into South Carolina society? Absolutely. Their lives and their fortunes were on the line, and they absolutely worked very hard to reintegrate. First, they had to apologize, and apologizing is hard. And some of them had to apologize multiple times to the same person. My favorite example is Elias Wall, who apologized not once, not twice, but three times to his uncle Henry Lawrence, before Henry Lawrence finally accepted his apology. And these are all letters, right? Even in the last letter, when Henry Lawrence finally accepts his apology, he has to chide him and remind him that he chose the wrong side, that his political principles are suspect, that his judgment is flawed. But now that he's finally given an apology that Henry Lawrence will accept, Lawrence, who is, by the way, one of the negotiators of the treaty that ends the war for independence, right? So somebody who's absolutely involved at the highest levels chooses to accept this apology. But even then, he exacts the price. Elias Ball was on the confiscation list, which meant he was banished from South Carolina. So Henry Lawrence says to him in a letter, 
all right, I'd like to help you out. You can go live on my Georgia plantation. Since you're not on the confiscation list of Georgia, you can legally live there. And you can be my overseer. And Elias Ball had managed to preserve some of his property and slaves. And, of course, Henry Lawrence is on the one hand using his considerable political influence to help Ball, and Ball is eventually pardoned and offered clemency in South Carolina. But at the same time, he has to use his property and his efforts as an overseer on Lawrence Plantation in Georgia to make Lawrence some money. And even then, Lawrence kind of exacts a price along the way. And I find that Elias Ball is not the only loyalist who did this, right? They have to abase themselves. They have to apologize. They have to work very hard to convince the people they live among that they are ready to be reliable, good neighbors, good members of the community. And the payoff for that is, as Philip Porche, as Elias Ball and others did, in 1783, they start to petition the legislature for clemency. And the way they actually convince the legislature to give them clemency is they give supporting petitions that are signed by lots of members of their own community, usually patriots. And when I went and looked at who actually managed to get clemency in the 1784 Act and who didn't, if you don't submit a supporting petition with a bunch of names of neighbors who are willing to attest to your character, your application is dead on arrival and you're not going to get clemency. It's only those who can show that they've done this hard work of reestablishing these ties and convincing those around them that they're going to be good neighbors and good citizens going forward who are able to get clemency. We've brought up the South Carolina Clemency Act a couple of times now, and I do really want us to explore this act in detail. But first, I think we need to know exactly what these apologies sounded like. You noted that they took the form of letters, but what was their tone? What exactly do you write to your Uncle Henry Lawrence to say, I'm really sorry, and please believe me, I'm really sorry? I wish I knew exactly how you make that case. It must have been incredibly difficult. But the interesting and telling thing is none of these letters exist. The way I know this is what they did is I have the letters that Patriots sent in reply. So I have the letters Henry Lawrence wrote to Elias Ball, and I have the letter Henry Lawrence wrote to his other overseer telling him, hey, Elias Ball is coming and here's why. In other cases, I have in the petition neighbors report who have good Patriot credentials themselves that I did get an apology and that I did get this letter seeking this, but none of the actual apologies exist. And by the time they get to the legislature, it seems like nobody wants to put anything frank in writing. You don't want to tell the legislature exactly what you did in the war in case that makes your case harder. So really, I'm talking about, right, what patriots say they got, and I don't have any existing letters from these loyalists. So I'd love to know exactly how you seem reliable and trustworthy, yet penitent and really, really sorry, but I don't have an example. I always hate it when you find information in a letter or some other source, only to find out that you can't locate the original letter because it no longer exists. Absolutely, especially when you can't imagine writing one of these yourself. What do you think happened to these letters? Do you think that family members burned them so that they could protect the legacy of their family name? I absolutely think they didn't want these to exist. I don't think it's an accident. I think it's too perilous. Henry Lawrence, I use his papers because he preserved them. There are something like 16 volumes of Henry Lawrence published papers in the official collection. And you want to tell me he has no letters from Elias Ball? Somebody destroyed them. Now we should go back and revisit the Clemency Act of 1784. Would you tell us about the act and what changed in South Carolina? Because in 1782, the state passed a Confiscation Act, which was meant to punish loyalists. And yet in 1784, just two years later, the state passed a Clemency Act, which could really be seen as an act to forgive loyalists. Well, on the one hand, I guess it could make them look a little silly. Part of the clue is even in 1782, they only single out a relative handful of people for punishment. And then they put them through this hard work of apologizing, of abasing themselves, of essentially rebuilding all their social connections in order to make a convincing case in 1784. So what the legislature actually did is they accept these petitions. And this might interest your readers. In the 18th century, a petition isn't just a piece of paper that somebody signed. 
or as I sometimes joke, toilet paper for the executive washroom. It carries the commands that it is read aloud on the floor of a legislature and debated. And so petitions mean a lot more in the 18th century. The South Carolina legislature forms committees, investigates these, they hold publicly advertised hearings where if somebody is really opposed to a particular loyalist getting clemency, they can show up and testify against them. And that's the whole point of having publicly advertised hearings. And in a few cases, people do show up. But in most cases, by this time, the loyalists have done the hard work of reintegrating and nobody shows up to oppose them. The better question, as you suggest, is why in the world do they do this? They come to believe that clemency is a smart policy. The thing that loyalists have to do in South Carolina is establish social ties or reestablish social ties, convince people that they are dependable, good neighbors. And at some level, throwing away good citizens who have these qualities starts to seem foolish. These are people you know. They had a chance to leave. They were determined to stay. They put effort into staying. Of course, their own self-interest makes it easier to stay. Nobody wakes up and thinks, I'd like to be a refugee and go to Nova Scotia. That wasn't anybody's dream plan. But nonetheless, the way South Carolinians come to think about it is these are the people who are among them. These are the people who want to be among them. These are the people who are trying so hard to show why they should stay. It would be foolish to run them off. The only ones they really wanted to run off, they already had. There's a series of public intellectuals. I mentioned Adonis Burke briefly. Another one is Christopher Gadsden. And they make all these arguments saying it would be foolish. It would pervert the very notion of the robust guarantees of citizenship in a democratic society that we're trying to rebuild to create a flawed or limited kind of citizenship such as we are imagining for loyalists. And I also think it matters a lot that the war had really only come to South Carolina in 1780, and the peace treaty is finally signed in 1783, and South Carolina has all these loyalists who really never leave and are part of the community, I'll bet, in somewhat fractured ways the whole time. So when it comes time to reintegrate them, they never left, and there they are, and it's easier I know you're in Boston, and I often use the example of Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, people are forced to leave in 1775 if they're loyalists. And in Massachusetts, they call them the returnees, which is really telling, right? They try to return a decade later, and by then they have no social ties that are strong enough to make people believe that they really should give them the benefit of the doubt. Would you tell us what the Clemency Act did? It's essentially a legislative act in 1784 that gives all of these loyalists their property back and their citizenship back. Something like 70% of the people named on the Confiscation Act in 1782 who are not absentee merchant houses get their property back in 1784. And there's a little bit of wavering in 1784. They say, well, maybe some of them should have some lighter punishment. And they double down on something called amerismant, which is to say having to pay a one-time tax. I might even dub it reparations since you were on the losing side of the war and we had to pay taxes to support the war and the loyalists benefited from the fact that the patriots ultimately won the war but didn't have to pay for it. Now they'll have to pay reparations or their fair share. In most cases, it's 12% of their estate. And I'm fascinated by this embarrassment and this issue of reparations, in part because it sounds so plausible on the one hand, we'll just give you a lighter punishment. And on the other hand, they never follow through. They back away quickly. The legislature just stops actually collecting these tax payments. One poor man named William Valentine is arrested in 1787 for not paying his embarrassment payments, and he's absolutely startled. And it's clear reading the record that he's startled because nobody is paying, right? Nobody's paying. Nobody's paid in years. Why did he get singled out one day? And Adonis Burke, who worked so hard to bring about clemency, says the worst possible idea is to create second-class citizens who have some restrictions, who have to pay these reparations. Now you've done the stupidest thing ever, which is to keep them within your own community, the body politic, and yet constantly irritate them and try to turn them into internal enemies. You either forgive them or you don't, but you don't keep them in this middle ground. 
In your book, From Revolution to Reunion, you noted that South Carolinians offered the most generous clemency in the United States. And I wonder if you could just talk to us for a moment about what aspects of the Clemency Act of 1784 made it so generous. First, how many people it covered, how very few people in South Carolina paid the ultimate price for their loyalism or for their sometimes practical decision to go with the British when the British were the strongest. It was the most generous because they rapidly turned away from sort of halfway house solutions like the immersement I spoke about. Some states also, and South Carolina tries this briefly, have restrictions on voting. Okay, we'll reintegrate some former loyalists, but they can't vote. In one place, they can't be teachers. All sort of limitations on their citizenship. And South Carolina pretty rapidly turns away from the idea that you could or should create a second-class kind of citizenship, as attractive as it might be to limit the rights of citizenship for former loyalists who are, of course, often deemed traitors, you ultimately create second-class citizenship for everybody. This is a nation that fails so dramatically at creating a world that's fair no matter your race, no matter your ethnic origin. And yet, in the instance of the loyalists, they really do manage to create this more fair and just society that says, either you're a citizen or you're not. We are not going to live with these sort of halfway house solutions. And so I think it's very generous in that way, too. We've explored how the war for independence in South Carolina was a civil war. Neighbor fighting neighbor, brother fighting brother. And we've also explored the different ways that South Carolinians reintegrated loyalists into their society. And Patrick has a question regarding reintegration. Was the reintegration of loyalists into South Carolina society more emotionally charged than the reintegration of loyalists into northern state society? Given that, you know, as we've discussed, the war in South Carolina was very civil warlike and so very violent. Great question. It absolutely was emotionally charged, given the incredible ferocity of the war. And yet, and this is the miracle at some level, despite their hatred for each other, they chose to forgive and even to forget. And surprisingly, it was actually harder for loyalists to return to Massachusetts than South Carolina. And I suspect the reason was most Massachusetts loyalists had to flee in 1775 and 1776. Even if they didn't leave the United States, they left Massachusetts. They went to other British army camps. When they sought to return, it was a decade later. They were literally now strangers, not neighbors, friends, and intimate acquaintances. And even though the experience of civil war was worse in South Carolina, South Carolina loyalists end up finding it easier to reintegrate and reclaim their property than those from Massachusetts. Bonnie would like to know more about the loyalists after their reintegration back into South Carolina society. Specifically, she'd like to know what impact they had on the new nation and on helping the new nation move forward after such a divisive war. I think that's a really interesting question, and it's one I might want to explore more in the future on the national scale. I know in South Carolina, the fascinating thing is loyalists quickly go on to recover the same social and economic position they had before the war. Some serve in the state legislature. Some loyalist commanders are elected to state legislative roles by 1790. I think that the fact that loyalists are reintegrated into the United States is this moment when we choose to be a more inclusive union, a more inclusive nation, because past political mistakes were forgiven because we turned away from any idea that you could have second-class citizenship or that citizenship could have constraints or limitations for some, but not others. As I suggested, there were bans on voting, and states gradually turn away from them. And with the adoption of the Constitution in 1787, all of these voting restrictions are supposed to go away. I know that in South Carolina, on this part I'm fascinated by, the children and grandchildren of loyalists go on to intermarry with the children and grandchildren of patriots to lead illustrious and wealthy lives. And yet, I was fascinated to find that several of the early South Carolina figures of preserving historical monuments of historical preservation are the grandchildren of loyalists. So Anne Pamela Cunningham, who is the woman who preserved Mount Vernon for the nation, is the grandchild of several loyalist commanders. The Cunninghams were an infamous loyalist family. It was not her grandfather, but it is a relative who was nicknamed Bloody Bill Cunningham for his loyalist exploits. 
and she was well aware of this background, and yet ultimately what she does is she preserves Mount Vernon. She preserves George Washington's patriot legacy for the nation. And so I was just fascinated to discover how many historic preservationists who preserved all of this for us are actually the descendants of loyalists who are almost inviting themselves in to our patriot nation. I'm really glad you brought up Anne Pamela Cunningham. Because Anne Pamela Cunningham and this discussion of preservationists is a perfect transition into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Now, at the end of From Revolution to Reunion, Rebecca discusses how South Carolinians actively worked to erase the internal conflict of the revolution and the actions of loyalists from their public memory. Rebecca, in your opinion, what might have happened if South Carolinians had kept loyalists and the violent civil war South Carolinians experienced during the War for Independence alive in their historical memory? How would an accurate version of the state's War for Independence experience have affected the course of its early republic and antebellum history? A couple of things. If they had taken what I think would have been the stupidest, worst path, if they had readmitted or turned a blind eye to the loyalists among them, such as the Cunningham family, while continuing to nurture hatred rather than deliberately forgetting these loyalists among them and their past, I think South Carolina would have been a much less stable society in the 19th century. In the 19th century, South Carolinians talk about, quote, the harmony we were famous for, end quote. And they revel in this idea that they have a harmonious political and social culture. And I think they would have been a less stable society if they had nurtured hatreds of white people amongst them. And I think we might very well have seen more slave rebellion in South Carolina had they showed this open disunity, had they made this decision. Nat Turner's rebellion, the one that shook the South, Nat Turner was from Virginia. But I think they could have found Nat Turner in South Carolina had circumstances been different like this. If they'd hated the loyalists and refused to readmit them, but at least remembered it accurately, I think American citizenship might have been diminished. I think that is a crucial moment in American history when a group of Americans decided that citizenship is an all-inclusive, all-in or all-out package. You don't get to create second-class citizenship. Now, I know that it's been done at times and places. Black men supposedly got the vote by constitutional amendment and reconstruction, and then were denied it for a very long time. I recognize that this sounds starry-eyed and pie in the sky, but it is a definitive moment when Americans decided you could not create legal second-class citizenship. And I think the last thing is, at the very end of the book, I suggest that South Carolinians made their society, or at least white society, more harmonious and more inclusive and stronger by choosing to reintegrate all of these loyalists and then forget about that reality as fast as possible. But that the dark side of that was they almost skipped into the American Civil War without tempering their expectations for how brutal civil wars really can be, and that they had forgotten in all of this that they too had fought a civil war and that it had been brutal and terrorizing and horrible. I don't think they would have magically avoided the civil war, but I do think they might have been more cautious, tempered their expectations, and not showed the zeal for entering a civil war, if they had remembered what it had been like literally only two generations before. Now that you've explored the loyalists who stayed and the reintegration into American society, what are you researching and writing about now? While I'm still interested in reintegration on the national level, I have some new research on old age and aging in the 18th century. I want to know where we got our terror of getting old from and when it was we came to think that creativity had to be tied to youth. That's fascinating. And as I'm getting older, I'd kind of like to know the answer to that question, too. I would, too. And I have this theory that it's the embrace of the Enlightenment and the American Revolution when we commit to this idea. Do you have a website or a place with more information about how we can contact you if we have any questions about loyalism or the war for independence in South Carolina? I would love to speak to some listeners. You can always go to my James Madison University page, and that has my email address. I tweet at R.N. Brannon, and I do have a website, RebeccaBrannon.com. Rebecca Brannon, 
Thank you for joining us to discuss the war for independence, loyalism, and how some loyalists were reintegrated into American society. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed this conversation, Liz. The war for independence in South Carolina was brutal. Neighbor fought neighbor, and more brothers fought each other in this war than they would in the later Civil War during the 1860s. And yet, most loyalists chose not to leave the United States with the British. They chose to stay. Which raises a really big question. How do you heal such a fractured and divided society? As Rebecca noted, it was a process. In South Carolina, we can see that patriots certainly sought to punish those who chose Great Britain over the United States. In 1782, South Carolinians passed a Confiscation Act designed to confiscate the property of those who supported the crown. However, it didn't take South Carolinians long to realize that the best way to repair their state after the war was to heal and unite its people. So in 1784, they passed a Clemency Act, which encouraged people to reach out to their friends, family, and community members and make amends. Now, just as the war had been fought in personal ways on the ground, making amends took on a similar form. South Carolinians reached out to each other and overcame their former political differences just so that they could move on and build a new nation and state. And I think this is pretty interesting because we often read about war and reconciliation as though they are distant, impersonal acts. And yet, Rebecca just showed us, at least during and after the War for Independence, both war and reconciliation were actually very close and personal acts. Look for more information about Rebecca, her book From Revolution to Reunion, and notes for what we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 126. If you enjoy thinking about history, sign up for DelanceyPlace.com's free daily email. Text nonfiction to 22828 or visit dp1776.com. And each day, they'll put a new thought-provoking excerpt from a book right in your inbox. Finally, if you had been a loyalist during the revolution, what would your apology letter to patriot friends and family members have looked like? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or tell us about it by posting a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.